Welcome to the RE Podcast, the first dedicated RE podcast for students and teachers. My name is Louisa Jane Smith and this is the RE Podcast, the podcast for those of you who think RE is boring, which it is, and I'll prove it to you. I'm here with the Reverend Cody Coyne, who's minister at Cross Street Chapel, a Unitarian church in Manchester. Reverend Cody Coyne, welcome to the RE Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So let's start by finding out a little bit more about you. Who is the Reverend Cody Coyne? (laughs) People will quickly glean that I'm not originally from the UK. I'm from the States. Uh, I was raised as a Unitarian in the US in the faiths called the UUA. When I was at university, I came over here to study music initially, but faith had always been a very significant part in my life. So when I was here, I ended up meeting my wife, who's British, uh, and we settled down here. And the sort of eventual plan of being a minister was going to be much later in life, and it just ended up because of the fates was brought forward much earlier in my life. Because you're actually fairly young. (laughs) <laughs> how old are you do you mind me asking no it's right i'm 37 i'm not as young as i as i think at times but in in respect to sort of many unitarian ministers there's a growing number of younger ministers but for many it is something that they they come to the faith later in life they come to the, the sense of a calling later in life and for myself like i sort of said i was expecting to have a career in music even being raised as a Unitarian, oh, I'll become a minister later in life. And it just it just conspired that that wasn't in the cards for me, that it was a more significant part of my life than I had anticipated when I was in my 20s. Amazing. And I'll come back to music in a minute and maybe I'll ask you some questions on that. But I don't know if some of our listeners might feel the same as I do in that I've heard of Unitarianism. Mm-hmm. I just don't really know what it is. So <laughs> could you just tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it's a faith that in terms of Christianity came out of the Reformation. So it has a very Christian sort of orientation or origins. One of the best explanations in a way that I've come across is from a colleague of mine, the Reverend Andrew Hill, who said, my view is incomplete and therefore my neighbor's view is incomplete, but together perhaps we'll have a more complete view of truth. So it's the understanding that we have our experience, which is sort of a valid form of theological exploration but it's also limited by our own humanness. And so we need to gather within communities to explore sort of wider truths. When people approach me and they say, oh, I I know what Unitarianism is, very often there's sort of three responses. There's someone who has a sort of fairly reasoned and accurate understanding of the faith. And then there's people who will say, oh, you're the people who don't believe in the Trinity. You're Christians, but you deny the Trinity which is slightly accurate, you know, sort of it's part of the truth, and it's partly complete, but it's still incomplete. And then there's people who say, well, you're the faith that you can believe whatever you want, which again has some element of truth in it, but again is, is inaccurate and incomplete. So it has this Christian origin and Christian roots, and many of our members will self-identify as Christians. Many of our chapels, you know, we meet on Sundays, for instance, so there's still this very Christian feel, and we, we celebrate many Christian holidays. But there is as well an understanding that Christianity in and of itself is one view of the divine world. And so people are encouraged to explore their own experiences, the wisdom of other faiths, to try and get an even fuller understanding of the world and of truth. So how would you describe your belief about God? I see God as a wellspring, as some form of sort of inspiration for me, something I can dip into which refreshes and rejuvenates me. Not often as a person, not often in that sense of a personal God, though I remember during my studies having this epiphany, I think that the the sense of a personal God means that to each of us, God is personal. So in that sense, perhaps my view of God is itself that sort of personal nature. So it's God is something that flows through the universe that we can at times tap into. At times, it sort of almost forces itself upon us in sort of that measure of grace that we might experience. And then who is Jesus and what is Jesus' relationship to God? Within Unitarianism, nowadays, Jesus is perceived to be, for some, perhaps perfectly human, which for us will very likely mean to include some measure of divinity. We tend to describe everyone as having some inherent worth and dignity, and that can be described as, as being a divine character amongst us all. So Jesus is one to emulate, one to be inspired by, to be to explore the metaphors of the miracles, which tends to be how we interpret the miracles. 
we draw a lot upon the, the teachings of Jesus more so than theological suggestion that Jesus was uniquely divine. And that's really interesting to look at his miracles as metaphors. Could you give us an example of one of those miracles and what the metaphor is that you get from it? There's the, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes that I absolutely, absolutely love. And this isn't, you know, this isn't restricted to Unitarianism. You can encounter it in other faiths as well, which I'll touch on in a second. But the, the suggestion, I have heard this lovely suggestion that when the loaves and the fishes were enough for everyone, it meant that Jesus was able to encourage everyone to share what they had brought. So it wasn't just, you know, sort of taking so many loaves and breaking them up amongst thousands of people, but about us then pulling out from ourselves what we're able to give. Mm, the miracle of generosity. Exactly. I mean, that's for me is, is, you know, the core of our faith is very much sort of, we look at the text metaphorically because it encourages us to explore ourselves, to see how we engage with the world. Are we being generous enough? Are we sharing? If we have plenty, are we sharing that with other people? And that's a really beautiful and universal message, isn't it? What's probably the main message of Unitarianism or the main idea? For me, it boils down to two sides of the same coin, that we have our experiences which need to be validated which need to be understood within the realm of some spiritual divine world. Although, you know, we want to recognize that we have atheist and humanist members within our congregations who perhaps uh, wouldn't describe it that way. So you have, yeah, the individual's experience as being fundamental to an understanding, but then the limitations of that requiring, you know, the need to gather as a community to share with each other our experiences so that we're able to grow as a community and not just as individuals. I mean, something that I've noticed through following you and Unitarian churches on Twitter and Instagram is just how accepting you are of people, that there is no judgment on who you are, there's no, no judgment on how you live your life, and that you really champion those groups of people in society that have experienced oppression or discrimination. What is the motivation for that? Some of it comes down to, like I say, that um, that understanding that our own view is limited. So we have to be aware of the, the experiences of others and give time for understanding their positions. The other significant element, especially I'd say within British Unitarianism, though it's not always expressed in our churches, is just the length of time that our churches and chapels were denied sort of those basic rights. So if you look into the sort of the history of Unitarianism in Britain, my chapel, for instance, was founded by the Reverend Henry Newcomb, who was a priest in the Church of England and was ejected in 1662 for refusing to affirm the 39 Articles. There was an event called the Great Ejection, and there were 2,000 priests. So a number, of, a lot of our congregations date themselves back to that time. From that point, Unitarianism, both as a theology and our churches, had very real sort of oppression sort of wrought upon us. We weren't allowed to congregate. We weren't allowed to sort of worship as we saw, as we saw fit. Later on, Unitarians weren't allowed to serve in certain political positions, for instance, or attend Oxford or Cambridge, which were the primary universities at the time. So we have that experience of, of having been an oppressed group, and that went all the way up until uh, the early 1800s. So we see that story in ourselves, and we, we recognize oppression when it's wreaked upon others and the need, like you say, for, for compassion uh, and respect for other viewpoints. What I find fascinating is that it, it's a really human belief system, isn't it? And it's very much based on mm -hmm. the ideals of humanism, that it's about love and acceptance and kindness and accepting our own flaws and accepting the flaws in other people. How do you see the afterlife? Is there any sort of belief in what happens next or what you need to do to get there? It will depend. And that's the, that's the most common answer. <laughs> I can give for Unitarian questions. It will depend upon the individual for my, for myself, because I sort of describe God as this like sort of greater consciousness that we can tap into. For me, death is that ultimate return to that consciousness. I think of it, you know, we were talking about music and, uh, I think of it as that sense of when I'm really into performing something, some piece of music, I forget who I am. I'm just, you know, it's just the music that's playing and I, it's just, it's a beautiful experience. So I hope, um, I can't say that death will be like this, but I hope that death will be like that, will be sort of a return to just sort of forgetting myself in the experience. And it's such a message of many religions, isn't it? It's about a sort of abandoning the self and getting rid of the ego. Yes. And that is a yes. common theme through so many religions. 
How do you view humans? And you said that generally you believe humans are incomplete or flawed. How are they created? What are their purpose? We've been a very pro-science faith. There was a a book that came out a few years ago sort of highlighting links between Darwin and Unitarian. Not not saying Darwin was Unitarian, but sort of making notes of colleagues and friends of his. So I think from a to step more into that sort of humanist view, sort of humanity just ex- yeah exists as, in some extent, as a product of evolution. Like I say, we read the Bible metaphorically, so we won't necessarily assert that the uh, story of creation as told in the Bible would be how things have literally happened. In terms of talking about sort of moral precepts or the, the sense of people being flawed, I don't know what the future is going to be. I hope that I can... I can make judgments that will be in the best interest of as many people as possible, but I know I'm going to make mistakes. That's an an inherent part of being human. So the challenge uh, and the conflict within humanity is is that in itself. It doesn't have to be sort of parsed much further than just saying that we have a limited view. We try to do good, but we're not going to attain that. So faith can be one of those places where we go, you know, we rejuvenate ourselves. We we become young again. We, We become we can sort of set aside. And if we believe in a concept such as grace, that then provides us with some measure to then carry on. Because it's a lot to, it's a very great burden, isn't it? To not have that sort of ability to forgive ourselves in order to feel like we are living with our faults uh, perpetually. Absolutely. And if you could wake up tomorrow and one thing would be different, what would you want that one thing to be? You mean just within sort of life in general? Yeah. I hate sort of, I don't say prioritizing the injustices in the world. The most pressing issue, I think that's universally understood is the, is the climate crisis. So, you know, I would say some, some measure towards reconciliation with that, recognizing as well, actually, that firstly, I mean, these, these issues are very much intertwined with injustices for the great majority of the, the world and for issues such as racism and such. And I think these things are, these issues are so, interconnected that hopefully tackling one will have an effect on on others so yeah i suppose if i had to have an answer it would be you know some resolution towards the climate crisis absolutely i totally agree with you and i think it's not being taken seriously by the people that need to take it seriously and we can do individually Mm. as much as we can to support the environment and support nature but there needs to be systemic change absolutely that was the, the word that came to my mind yeah absolutely now obviously music is still is quite a big part of your life if you could recommend one song that would maybe summarize what you love about music, what would that be? It's quite difficult because I, I was going to say, I worry I'll become quite, pre- sound quite pretentious in this. Yeah, I studied classical music and my interest was uh, sort of 20th century or contemporary music, um, which can be quite grating for, for quite a few people. I, for a long time, have considered Charles Ives' Fourth Symphony to be a very important work in my life. He wrote the piece partly, and in, in some parts of the piece were, in, were written in response to the sinking of the Titanic. It uses two beautiful Unitarian hymns, Nearer My God to Thee, in the sort of closing movement, and then Watchmen Tell Us of the Night in the first movement. So it encapsulates that sort of Christian progression from the Advent all the way up through Easter and Good Friday. It's a very ch- challenging piece, as his music is, is quite discordant for many ears. But especially that last movement, I just find absolutely beautiful. Wonderful. And is that available on, on the internet so we could listen to it? Yeah, yeah. You can certainly find it on Spotify or YouTube and wherever great music, wherever great music is played. Yeah. I'd recommend the Jose Servier recording. And part of his music and part of the challenge and beauty of his music is that very few recordings will actually sound alike because there's, it's just so dense. There's so much there. Amazing. Well, we'll put a link to that in the show notes so people can hear. And certainly it's a piece I've never heard of let alone listen to. So um, I'll very much look forward to listening to that and expanding my musical experience. If there's one final thought that you would like to leave our listeners with, what would that be? It's that double juxtaposition or the tension between loving and caring for ourselves, but also recognizing our limitations, trying to be engaged in conversation with one another, a very honest and nuanced conversation. It's not absent today, but it's certainly not highlighted in the media. I think the more people are able to just give a pause before getting at each other's throats, you know, both affirming our own position, but also giving enough space 
to acknowledge that maybe in some circumstances we might be wrong. Just that humility, isn't it, of accepting that other people think differently Mm -hmm. and right and wrong is not as black and white as maybe the media presents it. Yes. And to be open-minded and respectful of people that think differently. I think that's that's a beautiful message. Reverend Cody Coyne, it's been an absolute delight talking to you. I have learned so much and I think that so many of our listeners are going to be able to relate to the ideals of of Unitarianism and, and will feel that they have a much deeper understanding of it than they did before. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. I am Louisa Jane Smith and this has been the RE Podcast, the podcast for those of you who think RE is boring, which it is and I just proved it to you. But thank you so much for letting me bore the life out of you.